In the 1990s, Japan had faced one of the world's largest and most shocking economic collapses. This severe crisis led to a downfall in the country's banking system, as they were fueled by bad loans and regulatory failures, leading to the rise of zombie banks. These financial institutions were paralyzed by poor investments, unable to restructure their balance sheets, and continued lending to unproductive companies, often referred to as zombie firms. This crisis not only crippled Japan's economy during the so-called lost decade, but it continues to influence Japan's banking policies and economic landscape today. But exactly what went wrong? And how did zombie firms become one of Japan's biggest headaches today? Let's first start with Japan's economic bubble in the 1990s. The Japanese economic bubble of the late 1980s was marked by an extraordinary rise in asset prices, particularly in the real estate and stock markets. During this time, Japanese banks were at the forefront of this growth, lending aggressively to businesses and real estate ventures. However, a major flaw was that many of these loans were based on the inflated value of assets rather than solid financial fundamentals. The expectation that property and stock prices would continue to rise allowed banks to extend credit without adequately managing the risks. By the early 1990s, the bubble burst. Stock prices plummeted by about 60% while real estate prices dropped by around 50%, leaving the banking system vulnerable. This collapse resulted in a significant portion of loans becoming non-performing, as companies that had borrowed against their now worthless assets struggled to service their debts. The collateral that had supported these loans evaporated overnight, leaving banks exposed. At the heart of this crisis was the refusal of the banks to acknowledge the true extent of their bad loans. Rather than facing the reality of insolvency, many banks chose to prop up failing businesses by extending further credit to them. These businesses became known as zombie firms. These firms, unable to cover their debt obligations from profits, were kept alive through continuous injections of credit, despite having no real chance of recovery. The rise of zombie firms had devastating effects on Japan's economic landscape. Normally, in a functioning market, failing companies are allowed to go bankrupt, freeing up resources such as labor and capital for more productive enterprises. However, in Japan during the 1990s, this process was thwarted. Zombie firms continued to exist, employing resources inefficiently and depressing wages which reduced the profitability of healthier firms in the same sectors. In industries dominated by zombie firms, productivity dropped sharply. Studies indicated that these industries experienced lower levels of job creation and destruction, lower investment in innovation, and increased excess capacity. Essentially, zombie firms created a form of economic congestion where unproductive companies lingered on life support while healthy firms struggled to grow and innovate due to reduced market opportunities and tighter competition in stagnant sectors. The ripple effects of the crisis also extended to non-zombie firms. Companies that were not directly impacted by the bad loans still faced difficulties because the zombie firms were distorting market conditions. Prices were artificially low and wages were kept high due to zombie firms holding on to workers whose productivity was no longer justifiable. As a result, healthier companies found it harder to expand, invest, or increase their market share. Moreover, the banks themselves, burdened by the weight of non-performing loans, could not extend credit to new and innovative companies. The presence of zombies in their portfolios discouraged banks from making riskier investments, further slowing down economic growth. At the root of the problem was a regulatory environment that failed to act decisively in the early stages of the crisis. The Japanese Ministry of Finance and the Bank of Japan were slow to acknowledge the magnitude of the problem. 
Even when it became apparent that the banks were overwhelmed by bad loans, political considerations delayed necessary reforms. The government feared that mass bankruptcies of zombie firms would lead to an economic and political disaster. In the 1990s, Japan's political system was deeply intertwined with its banking sector. The Kiretsu system, large conglomerates with close ties to banks, ensured that many failing businesses had political backing. The banks, influenced by their ties to these conglomerates, continued to lend to insolvent firms to avoid politically sensitive bankruptcies. This meant that even when it was clear that these firms would not recover, the banks were compelled to support them with further loans, often in exchange for vague promises of future restructuring. Regulators also failed to enforce capital adequacy rules effectively. Under the Basel Accords, banks were required to maintain a minimum level of capital relative to their risk-weighted assets. However, Japanese regulators were lenient in enforcing these standards, allowing banks to use creative accounting techniques to mask the true extent of their financial problems. This further prolonged the crisis, as banks continued to roll over bad loans rather than write them off. It was not until the early 2000s that Japan began to take significant steps to address the zombie bank crisis. One of the most important reforms was the creation of the Financial Reconstruction Commission, FRC, in 1998. The FRC was tasked with overseeing the restructuring of the banking sector, including the liquidation of non-performing loans and the recapitalization of failing banks. The government also established the Resolution and Collection Corporation, RCC, to buy bad loans from banks and sell off the underlying assets. This allowed banks to clean up their balance sheets and resume lending to healthier companies. By removing the bad loans from the banking system, the RCC played a crucial role in restoring stability to Japan's financial sector. In addition to these institutional reforms, the government injected significant public funds into the banking system to recapitalize struggling banks. Between 1998 and 2003, the government spent over 12 trillion yen, approximately $100 billion, on bank recapitalization programs. This helped to shore up the bank's capital reserves, allowing them to meet international capital adequacy requirements and regain the confidence of investors. A crucial aspect of the reform effort was stricter oversight of banks. Regulators introduced tougher rules on capital adequacy, requiring banks to maintain higher levels of capital relative to their assets. Banks were also required to be more transparent in their reporting of non-performing loans, making it harder for them to hide the true extent of their problems. While the reforms of the early 2000s helped to stabilize Japan's banking system, the legacy of the zombie bank crisis continues to affect the Japanese economy today. One of the most significant consequences of the crisis has been the long-term impact on productivity and innovation. In addition, the crisis has left a lasting mark on Japan's financial system. Japanese banks, scarred by the experience of the 1990s, have become highly risk-averse. Even today, Japanese banks are reluctant to lend to new and innovative companies, preferring to focus on maintaining their capital reserves and minimizing risk. This cautious approach to lending has contributed to the country's continued low levels of investment in research and development, R and D, and innovation. The Japanese government has also continued to maintain an aggressive monetary policy in response to the long-term effects of the crisis. The Bank of Japan BOJ, has kept interest rates at or near zero for much of the past two decades and has implemented several rounds of quantitative easing to stimulate the economy. However, some analysts warn that these policies could create a new generation of zombie firms as companies that would otherwise fail are able to survive due to cheap credit. Some examples of Japanese zombie firms and banks are the likes of Daiei, 
which is a major retailer that expanded rapidly during the 1980s. Following the asset price bubble's collapse, Daiye faced significant financial difficulties. However, instead of entering bankruptcy, it received continued support from its main bank, allowing it to operate despite its insolvency. Another case is Hokkaido Takushiku Bank, which, during the 1990s, extended substantial loans to companies in the real estate and construction sectors. When the asset price bubble burst, many of these borrowers defaulted. Rather than recognizing these losses and restructuring, the bank continued to roll over the loans, effectively keeping the borrowers, and itself, afloat. Probably, the most famous example of all is Toshiba, which is a conglomerate that encountered severe financial difficulties in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Toshiba's challenges were compounded by an accounting scandal and substantial losses in its nuclear power business, leading to questions about its viability. The Japanese banking crisis of the 1990s, which gave rise to the phenomenon of zombie banks and zombie firms, was a defining moment in the country's economic history. The crisis, driven by reckless lending and mismanagement, was prolonged by regulatory failures and political indecision. While the reforms of the 2000s helped to stabilize the banking system and restore some level of economic growth, the legacy of the crisis continues to influence Japan's financial landscape today. But anyway, do let us know what you think. Thanks for watching.